This uh, webinar will be about professional email practice. Um, to get more effective results with your correspondence. Um, and I give this with some humility because I sometimes I'm not perfect with my emails. So I think we all make mistakes, but this is the best practices. So general table of contents, we're going to run through manners and formalities, um, clarity and signatures, which people have already mentioned in the chat is it can be difficult to be clear and how do we sign it to create good relationships? So in brief, the table of contents is how to send emails without making people go, ah, I think we've all had those emails. So um, this little quote um, from a judge, she says, if I waited until I had all my ducks in a row, I would never get across the street. Sometimes you just have to gather up what you've got and make a run for it. True. And a lot of us feel like that when we get emails, we think, oh, I have to respond right away. And or you think, oh, I don't have time. So I'm just going to send a quick response. And that causes so much trouble. So I don't know if you know who Viktor Frankl is, but he's an amazing philosopher. Um, and he said, uh, freedom is in the time between the stimulus and your response. And so he came up with most of his philosophy while he was spending time in concentration camps, obviously against his will. Um, and so if, if people in concentration camps can find freedom in between the stimulus and their responses, I think we can find some freedom in between receiving an email and deciding not to be stressed enough to just send it out right away. So even if you feel stressed, reading your email should not always be like herding cats. And this herd of mice here are all the people that you have sent emails to and wasted their time. So, you know, sometimes think about that. You sending out a fast email can waste, you know, dozens and dozens of man hours if you, if you multiply it by all the people that you've annoyed. So that's kind of something to think about is you want to be sending out good vibes. You want to be sending out efficiency and you want to be making people happy. And if you're sending out quick emails, it can end up making a lot of annoyed people in a short period of time. So do not save your time at the expense of other people's time. The writer takes the time. I'm sure you've heard me say this before if you've been to any of my other webinars. The writer takes the time so the reader doesn't have to. Write that down. The writer takes the time so the reader doesn't have to. That's called good writing things. Um, so spending extra time to polish your emails will get you um, faster answers, clearer answers, and more open and trusting relationships. So it's really worth spending this time, even if you feel that you really don't have time. You do have the time. You can make that time. So another thing is that a lot of people say that they think you're not allowed to format the emails. They think that you can only use um, plain formatting in an email, and that's not true, um, especially if you have a lot of information, which somebody already mentioned. You can use headings, you can use paragraph breaks, you can use bulleted lists, um, you can use bold um, and italic and color within reason, so we don't really want to be getting super creative, but if you have a lot of information in there, you should be thinking of formatting it somehow. You don't want to make a wall of text when you're writing a report and you don't want to make a wall of text when you're writing an email you want it to be engaging so headers and subject lines um, start out as you mean to go on be informative um, be clear and reasonably detailed and make sure that the headers actually match the content so again we are all guilty i think of just forwarding emails or responding to emails and this is actually a problem with software um, a few of the problems with emails are kind of from the software. I know I mainly use Gmail and the Gmail hides the subject line unless you specifically remember to ask it to change the subject line. So I would suggest that if you are emailing a lot and you want it to be really perfect, you could make a little sticky note on the side of your computer reminding you, change the subject line, make sure that it's relevant all the time. So here are some strategies to deal with email overload because Emails can take your entire work day, especially if you have students or you have a lot of colleagues, people are copying you and everything. So here are four things that you can do. 
first you prioritize and you probably naturally do this but sometimes doing this more intentionally and actually planning to do these things can give you a better procedure so first of all prioritize people um, certain people you want to respond to quicker or with more thought and spend more time making the email perfect other people you know, aren't as important to you. That's that's reality, especially the higher up you get in the hierarchy, the more people ask you questions sometimes. And you can, I, I do this sometimes, you sometimes spend a lot of time helping a mentee and then you have to stay up very late to get your own work done. So just be mindful of that, especially if you're feeling stressed. Um, so actually scheduling it, you know, some people I know are strict about eight to nine in the morning, they get it all cleared up. I really find it is a good use of time the way that I manage my inbox is that I keep it empty because my inbox is kind of my to-do list. So all the meetings that I have in the week or the interviews I'm doing for the course, those are all in my inbox. Um, and then you, you can make um, another folder that you could put emails into that you want to get to later. But I know for myself that every time I do that, I tend to go back a few years later and I've not answered those. So if you have, you can also use sorting things into folders but if you have a very cluttered inbox it's probably causing you stress um and here's a strategy for using time saving templates so if you have to do the same kind of emails all the time um you can use a template to save time so this is a university prof in saskatchewan and she says that she has this email signature because a lot of people are asking her for favors all the time so she thinks this template idea has saved her one gazillion hours in time. A cool gazillion, it's pretty good. So it saves her time that she delays responding. So that's what I was telling you about, like just letting that stuff pile up in your inbox. It costs you a lot of time in task switching every time you look at it. Um, time spent on things that you don't really wanna do. Um, and the more, she, so, because this template helps her to say no to things. So the more she uses this template, the more comfortable she is using it. And the hidden beauty of it is that the more she says no, the more she has time to say yes to the things that are exciting and energizing. And many successful people say that. Once you get quite successful, you have to get good at saying no. Um, so she says, this is a wall of text. I would actually improve this just by entering some um, line breaks. So it's nice of you to think to me, I have a number of things I'm doing because of this, I'm not taking on any new commitments. Thank you for the invitation. I do appreciate it. So it's a grateful message. It's a friendly message. She's not turning people away rudely, um, but she's also not spending any time on it. All she has to do is copy and paste this. Um, and so I asked uh, on LinkedIn and a couple of people, um, what, what are some questions you have? And so, uh, Zhang Vai Ning, how do you politely and professionally follow up with email when you have not heard back from your recipients? So I would go again to that. Freedom is in the time between the stimulus and your response. So it can be really frustrating if you need a response. So my first answer would be um, pause for a second and think. Um, and then I would say, consider the timeline of the project. Do you need a response within a day or a week? Um, it, it can, it, again, it takes a lot of our time to wait for a response. Um, so try to reduce that. So um, consider telephoning or chatting with them. Sometimes I go straight to LinkedIn and just chat with people instead of waiting for them to get back to me on email. People interact differently on different platforms. Um, consider writing, um, can you please give me a response by March 5th in the original email? So if you know, especially if you're on a project and you know that you need answers in a certain period of time, um ask just ask people to to give you that answer and then if they haven't followed up with you by march 5th um then you can get back to them and say oh regarding my email of march 3rd in fact i think i say that i'm just checking back with you on my email of march 3rd um, i need your answer about x so we can get the subcontractors going on site right put the um reason that you're asking the consequence and if this is a common problem for you this is another place that people make a template. Um, so if you're if you're having to check with lots of people about a project and you're often having to check with people who are tardy, it might be handy to have a template of this. This is an example. I know it's kind of pixelated because I just screenshot this from another colleague was saying 
you know, here's one, it's a very polite one saying, hey, did you get my email? I'm just sending it again in case you didn't receive it. And I, I've often sent that too. Did you receive my email? I haven't heard back. And I think that as long as you're polite and friendly, then that's perfect. Um, so here's a sample template for a project document flow from juniors. So if this is, this is like say a senior scientist or a senior engineer who's having to uh, constantly give feedback to the junior engineers. And that's a very common job position. So then you could just have um, a template like this. And then you're always saying, hello, so-and-so, here's my project, your project with my comments, the main changes I suggest are, and then you put the date in, and then you don't forget to say any of those important pieces. And notice that in her signature, she gives her phone number so that the junior does not have to waste time on the tiny little task of looking up phone numbers. You know, the more time we can save people on these tiny tasks, the happier they feel. So we're gonna use the time that we just saved with all those strategies to keep important people happy. Because the people that are in our high priority list, so these would be our direct team members, um, people we're in love with. <laughs> the family members should be higher on your priority list. Um, so effort shines. And one of the best bouquets of flowers you can give somebody is a praise sandwich. And so what I mean by a praise sandwich is you start with something nice, so dear Allison, thank you for your work on the maps for the Billy River project. You always do such meticulous work. So that's a nice little bouquet of flowers. Allison's gonna feel happy after that sentence. We need to discuss a few revisions to the styling. So this is actually the meat of this sandwich here. There's a problem with her project, but the manager hasn't just come in and said, there's a problem with the project. The manager has said, you did a great job. However, we need to do a few things. Um, and then another little bouquet of flowers. I look forward to our discussion. And then a very important thing that people often miss. Does next Monday at 10 a.m. work for you? So we need that call to action, right? If you're sending an email, hopefully it's, you know, a flow, maybe it's the end of the chain and that's fine. Um, but a call to action is very good rather than just assuming people understand that they need to get back to you and have a meeting. So I, so many people make assumptions in emails. They might assume that they talk to Allison and they are expecting Allison to ask for a meeting, but maybe, especially if it's juniors, they might not realize that you're expecting them to ask for a meeting. And then um, Sherry, who's a nice person, says thank you, which I like. Next, some things that make us go arg. And if you have particular things that make you go arg, you could write them in the chat right now. And I don't know, Marnie, if you've seen any questions yet. I see you're still busy admitting people, which is kind of fun. 300 people, that's fun. Uh, does anybody have any questions in the chat? There was one question. Where do you save the templates? I have Word templates, but need to reformat every time I insert them into my email. Reformatting causes frustration. Oh, definitely. I would actually save them. I, I save a lot of things in my draft box. So I said I use my inbox as my to-do list. I also use my draft for heaps of things. So I just save it in the draft and then I copy and paste it from the draft into the, into the email I'm actually sending. That was a good question. Do we have any more questions? I need to open up my chat window here. Emails written in all caps. Oh yes, that makes people go arg for sure. <laughs> and not answering all the questions. Yes long emails with unimportant or repeated information. So that's a matter of not editing it, uh, sending old strings or short responses. There was one okay. comment about people using reply all when it's not necessary. Yeah, and that you see, that's one of those waste time wasting things that are gonna make people not like you very much. So try, try not to do that. I'm gonna go into a few other things. So confusing emails which a few of those things people have mentioned qualify as confusing emails. So if um, I would suggest that you go to the webinar we did on readability and all those readability strategies that I mentioned, and one of them is making bulleted lists out of things. And if you make a bulleted list out of things and you say, I need three answers, then you'll get three answers. So readability strategies definitely help. Um, so people do all these things in emails. They use acronyms that they don't explain. So basically they're assuming that you're reading their mind, right? They refer to unknown people and resources. So that this one also 
I'm going to be going soon to um, what I call sort of internet dating for professionals. Um, when you're on an email list, so editors, I've been doing this since 1999 because I've been editing online since then. But you know, you have an email list and there's 300 people on the email list and you're talking about professional issues. So you ask about whatever it is that's important to you. Don't go assuming that everybody on the list knows your in-joke. And if only 15 people on the group know your in-joke, then just save them for when you're talking to those 15 people because you're probably annoying the other 285 people. That's my advice. Um, compute when there's no subject header or as people have mentioned, when it's the wrong subject header. And, and also subject headers are a really great way to store and then find information later in emails. So I think subject headers are so important. Um, stream of consciousness writing. So people that, and I, that one's mentioned in the chat too, people that just repeat themselves and they just say every little thought in their head. Um, and probably of all of these, my least favorite one is blank face, empty headed correspondence, by which I mean people who don't sign their names. And this is actually also a software issue, people not signing their names, because in a lot of programs, you know, our face is right there, or maybe your work signature always pops up and you forget to sign your name. I mean, we all forget now and then, but bad habit. Um, so here is an example of a stream of consciousness. This is the same project from Cheryl, except Cheryl is cranky and not professional in this one. So she receives the thing from Allison and she says, we sent out the guidelines in February for the map. And there was lots of details about how to do this, that, and the other thing. Do we need to resend these to you? Or I just don't understand why you screwed up. So, you know, I can understand that Cheryl felt this way when she received the project. Um, lots of us feel this way when we receive substandard work, but this isn't gonna get a very good example, right? Um, a good result. Allison's going to feel terrible after this email. And also, there is absolutely no call for action in this email. It's just stream of consciousness and it's a wall as well. The opposite, which also has been mentioned in the chat, is just abrupt emails. So, Allison, there's problems with those Billy River maps. You can just imagine Allison's like, oh. <laughs> so, you know, the last email might have made her feel sad. But this one's just going to be like, what? What were the problems? What am I supposed to do? Where am I supposed to go next? No idea. So kind of, I already showed you the best example, but even that one could be made better by say, well, overall, they look great. There's a few issues. Let's meet to fix them up, right? So even if she's feeling super cranky, she can still always decide as a best practice to put some little cheerful thing in the front. You know, sometimes I just say, Happy Tuesday, if I can't think of anything else. Like, just try to put something nice in the email. Be friendly. Think about some detail about what you're thinking. So next step, um, emojis. So I'm not going into emojis in this webinar, but there is plenty of research out there if you go looking on the internet um, that suggests that using emojis, even in business emails, can help so for example, an email like this, that seems pretty cranky or that might seem cranky, you know, there might be a place for a happy face somewhere. Maybe not this one, but other ones. Um, so use full sentences instead of fragments. Um, again, that's a matter of taking that space and time and, and deciding to revise a little bit and use friendly, clear formatting. I was trying to look for that Gothic blood dripping font here. Our own names spelled wrong. So I offer, I don't think you're going to beat me on this one, but share your wrong spellings in the chat, the ways that people have spelled your names wrong. It's very, very unhappy making. So Allison doesn't want to talk to Turkey who couldn't bother to spell her name right. And you know what makes me crazy? People misspell it when your email is right there. You've just spelled it and they look at that and then they spell it wrong. So I actually have something. So my just happened yesterday. I get all these, but somebody yesterday said, Dear Judith. <laughs> I'm, like, I, I'm not Judith. So I actually wrote back and said, Are you actually making this request of me or did you want to ask Judith? But, you know, there's a caveat to here. I tried so far, I've tried twice to immigrate to France and I failed both times, but I feel reassured because I hear lots of people try to immigrate and fail two or three times before they succeed. Anyway, in France, they make the mistake of calling me Christelle sometimes. 
but that makes me feel happy because I feel like then I belong to the culture because they've translated my name to a culture that makes sense to them. And I think I, I have lots of immigrant friends in Canada who say the same. I had a friend whose name was Hoot uh, in Asia and he moved to Canada and he changed it to Richard because he wanted to be rich. So he just chose a local name. And so I think a lot of people have these experiences of your name changes when you're in a different country. And we're also coming up to something else um, about that. So what to do when people get your name wrong? So I am saying um, that you should sign it more often because as I said, a lot of people are out of the habit of signing their name and it can be really tricky. So um, I mentioned Zhang Wai Ning. Um, so I actually wrote him and said, I just wanna make sure is Zhang Wai your first name and Ning, your, so your Dr. Ning as your second name. And he said, yes, that's correct. And nowadays, sometimes the software has it flipped. Or, or sometimes even on LinkedIn, I see people putting their names um, backwards, like with a comma. And so, especially when we see languages that we're not familiar with, um, we can feel shy about saying people's names and then we're more likely to get it wrong. You know, and, and sometimes like he was telling me, he has a colleague named uh, something Victor and people are always calling that guy Victor as the first name. And it can just be really frustrating. So my advice would just be, you know, sign it as much as you can. And then the next thing was, what about, um, you know, when you use the autofill function and you give it to the wrong people? We've all done this, that we send uh, an email to um, Krista Galois when we meant to send it to Krista Bedwin. And so what do you do when you send it to the wrong person? And again, I would just go straight to Dale Carnegie and I would say, um, write to the person you sent the wrong email to and, and touch base and apologize. And I often find if I've done this, uh, usually the person that was in my contact list is someone that I enjoy talking to and I might not have talked to recently. So chat to them and say, sorry, I wrote you, by, by the way, how are things going? Use it as a friendly, cheerful opportunity. We all make mistakes. That's not, that's not grav, that's not serious. I couldn't resist some examples for internet dating because I realized they tie closely to what I was talking about with um, internet, uh, what I call professional internet dating. So um, those email forums that you might belong to. Because I have blonde hair, a lot of people just write to the blonde hair. And they're like, you look good. How are you with not even proper sentences? And this is no effort. And we don't know who the sender is. A lot of times they don't even have a photo on their profile, right? It, it's just, it's one of those frust. This makes me go arg for sure. And then normally they're also accompanied by empty profiles. Um, this same thing happens with work though. You know, I get people on the email list give this lit, this answer, and then they'll just sign it, you know, Bob. Well, who are you, Bob? And what are your credentials, right? So that's where it's more important. So here's another example of a way we could do it um, professionally, right? Hello, I read your profile and I love how you talk about your travels to Europe. I think we have a lot in common. Take a look at my profile and let me know if I interest you too. Brangelina. So Brangelina probably has a nice photo and some details on their profile. So, you know, this is the same thing with LinkedIn. Some people's LinkedIn profiles show no effort and they don't have a photo. You know, even if you don't think that you're attractive, that doesn't matter, still put a photo. You know, your face is your handshake on the internet. Your name is your handshake. You need to give people something to hang on to. Um, so this is an awesome email because the sender shows evidence of intelligence and competence. So on an email list, instead of saying that they looked at your profile, maybe they would say, I just read your email on the email list, right? The signature is a handshake and there's a direction to the conversation. So again, that call to action and the tone is positive. Um, so again, with professional approaches, show interest in the other person of the conversation. So this could also be someone that you back supposing we're meeting in person again, or even actually meeting on Zoom. I have done quite a bit of networking on Zoom over the last year. So um, I get the person's email usually while we're in the Zoom chat or the meeting, and then I'll write to them later and I'll say, well, I really liked what you said about X, or 
we're both interested in why and let's talk about that further. I've made a few friends in Quebec that way through the Plain Language Association recently. Um, and so introduce yourself, uh, sign your name uh, and email signature. This is where we're gonna get into it. So when I say that Bob didn't tell us anything about himself, what I would like Bob to do on that email list is say bobsmith.com. And then if I wanna know something about Bob, I can go to bobsmith.com and I can probably see his photo and his publications and his you know, general uh, gist of his work, um, which is good. And then if you ask for something, it's really nice to offer something in return. Um, that's just good relationship building. <laughs> this actually happened to me last week too. I asked a question on the Editors Association of Europe and this, this old guy actually wrote and said, I know the answer to your question. It's in my book. Here's, here's where you can buy it. <laughs> and I'm like, I, I don't even, this is terrible, right? Yeah, like if you're not gonna tell me the answer right now, I'm certainly not gonna buy your book. This is not the way to do business. But that doesn't mean you can't let colleagues know you have a book. And I would call this a perfect way to let you know. So this is a different editing list. And um, people were discussing polygamy and polygyny. And uh, they wanted a specific answer. And so this person says, fellow anybody, begins in a friendly way. Um, greetings from a longtime listener, first time poster. So she lets us know that she's part of this group and she's been paying attention for a long time. And then she says, I figure I should weigh in on this as I have literally written a book on the subject. And so she's excited about her book, but it is completely relevant in this context. And then the rest of that paragraph, she gives the answer to the question that the person was asking about polygamy, polygyny and polyandry um, and, and specifically how she would use it. And if that person wanted more detail, look at that, contact details at the bottom and, and also then in the polite little bracket, by the way, if you want to see my book. So there's nothing invasive about this. It's just like, wow, here's a really neat person doing something cool. And I went and checked out her web pages because even though this is totally not my area of research, it just seemed really cool. Dara Rasami and Two Kingdoms, it just sounds fun. And the web pages are cool too. See, cool people are just all around cool. That's all how it often is. So what do we need in an email signature? So there's an editor I used to know in, in Ottawa named Antonia Morton, and she always had something like this on her signature. And it said, if good writing makes a window on the world, good editing is a squirt of Windex. And so she didn't really have to give us contact details because this was that um, list I told you about 1999, you know, it was before Facebook. So we all knew each other on this list, maybe 500 of us, I don't know. But this little signature reminds you every time you read it, um, that she's an editor. And so I think that that's appropriate and we could contact her because the email list um, provided contact details. I changed all the contact details on this one because I think this is a bad signature. I'm interested if you think it's bad or good, but what I find wrong about it is it looks like it's an entire email all by himself. And I find it too self-aggrandizing. I don't think that this is the place to write a whole essay about yourself and all the people who think you're great. Um, I think that it's more polite to just put baldynester.com and people can then go in and find you. And so he actually has this italic part is actually a cool little joke and it, it's a nod to feminism and it, it tells us he's a computer guy, right? So Lovelace coded. So Ada Lovelace, a uh, very awesome computer woman that we often haven't heard about because she's female um, and Turing and Babbage. So see, it could be cool if we didn't have those other 10 lines before. it. So what we actually need is reasonable detail of who you are and your contact details. So this is another thing. Don't make people go looking for your contact details. I know I already said that once before, these tiny little tasks that you make people do, whether it's looking up your acronyms or looking up your phone number or trying to remember who you are within the organization are, can be really exhausting and they can just turn people away from you. So make life convenient for your correspondence. That's good correspondence. Um, so this is uh, my boss at UBC. And the thing about corporate signatures is people don't actually see them usually because we're so used to seeing that underline that underneath that dotted line I don't need to look there unless I need to get contact with him right but because I was making this webinar I noticed he's got his um research gate profile there and then I clicked on it and I'm like wow 
like 58 publications and they're all really interesting. But I wasn't forced to look at that. I only looked at that when I had time to do it. So that's polite. Uh, and here's Marnie's. Um, it's similar. And Marnie's also has this very nice thing at the bottom. UBC Okanagan is situated in the unceded traditional and ancestral territory of the Silix people. And that, that reminded me that I actually wanted this webinar to say that I'm on the Mi'kmaq land, also unceded territory. Um, and so the good thing about corporate signatures is that they tell you the job role of the person and they tell you where to find them. And in Marnie's case, it also tells us which project she's working on. So that's cool. Um, this is an old colleague from Golder. This was our official one. And one thing I noticed that's better about the UBC one than maybe this one used to be is that this one's um, quite wide. And so it often ended up getting uh, squashed onto multiple lines like mine did. And then me being a general person who often doesn't follow the rules, I also put my office number in here. Um, and the reason I put my office number in here is that when I was editing in-house, I wanted, I, some people would come and see me um, at my cubicle about their um, editing details. And I wanted people to come see me. So I put my office number as a way of getting people to come see me. You can do that with your signature. You can put something that's suitable for a good reason. Even though the brand people will tell you you really shouldn't break the rules. But So here's an example of a freelancer, a geologist. So he puts um, his location and he puts his phone numbers. So it's easy to contact him. And even though you might think, well, he's using this on his Gmail. So why is he repeating it? Well, you never know. Things get forwarded. It's just. It's nothing, it doesn't hurt things being there. I often would just use, so again, if I'm writing on an email list, I often like to put my web page. So I don't have to do this big paragraph explaining my credentials to answer a question. I can just answer the question and then I can um, put my website. And if people want to know what my credentials are, they can go look it up themselves. And if it's a project, I, I don't put the website all the time. So I like to think through my signature uh, in correspondence and often not put the whole thing because I'm not part of a big corporation. So I don't have that thing of people trying to find me in the corporation. So what's appropriate might depend on what context and it might not be the, the same appropriateness all the time. Can you have a positive model? Yes, absolutely. Or a motivating phrase? Yes. Like the Windex thing is kind of like that. And so, Here's my email in case you have ideas or questions. And that link again is where you can find the recording. So if you didn't write it down before and you wanna find the recording, um, that's where we can go. And now I'll try to answer some of the questions that are in here. So Krista, I've been recording yeah. the questions as they come in so that we don't lose them this time. So I have a Word okay. document here full of questions. Did you want me to- Absolutely, with... shoot. Okay. Wonderful. So one um, was about emails getting lost in their inboxes. There's subscriptions to newsletters, events, campaigns, and all those emails that need to get replies get lost. Do you have any tips? I, um, yeah. So my tips are for, for email lists, you can send them to a folder immediately. Some questions about email signatures and is, is the word sincerely is that using that as a, in closing, is that outdated? It might be a little bit outdated, but it's polite. So I don't think that people will be annoyed by it unless they're ultra modern and they wish you were more hip. <laughs> I, I feel happy if people say sincerely. I don't mind a little bit of old fashioned if I, I find it charming. So it depends who you're corresponding with. Somebody asked here, what about cold calling? So I would say for cold calling, um, try not to cold call, try to get some real people. And so in terms of if you go out and volunteer or you join email lists or you try to find somebody in an organization, you know, that takes longer, but you're going to have so much more success than cold calling. So my advice would be to try and avoid cold calling. And if you have to cold call, then be ultra positive. And then I, there would be also kinds of marketing advice about that. So. Um, one question just came into the chat now, which was you mentioned using point form to ask multiple questions. 
However, I found that people only answer one of your questions and not necessarily the first one. Is it better to just keep the scope of the email tighter? Sometimes it's better. And I also just think if you put numbers and then you put at the beginning, um, I need three answers from you to move this project forward, um, then that's okay. So say three answers. And then if they don't give you three answers, and if you put one, two, three, then they're just being obtuse. Whereas if you have three bulleted points, they might not realize that you're actually looking for three answers. And also I've seen so many consultants just send a wall of text and be frustrated they didn't get the three answers they were asking for, but it wasn't clear enough. So just try to be clear and sometimes send more than one email if you think that's appropriate. Are exclamation marks young and less professional? Maybe, use them sprinkled. I use them but um, I often delete a lot also. I type more than I actually send because I look at the email and I delete <laughs> several of my exclamation marks. Is there a way that you can have um, a delay for the send option in your emails? Yep, that'll depend on which email client you're using. So you just have to search the function. Like, you know, look, it's easy enough to do. Okay. And just, and then, just Google it or, or go on YouTube okay. if you want to know. What about emojis? I'm sometimes like on Fridays, you know, I don't mind sending out something that's like a happy emoji, but is it based on your relationship with the individual that you're sending it to essentially? So they don't take it the wrong way. It can be, but like I didn't, I didn't mention swearing in this um, email, but some people think that they're good enough friends that they can swear in professional emails. And I would say, no, it doesn't matter how good of friends you are. Even if you live together at home, don't swear in the professional email. So um, I mentioned emojis earlier. So using a smiley emoji in professional emails might make sense. But um, when you say like Fridays, I'm thinking you're going a little bit over the top of what I mentioned earlier. And uh, I also mentioned earlier, like there's a lot of research out there. So go and look for that research and there's pages and pages and articles and articles written about emojis and business emails, and they can be positive, but you need to use them properly. How do you address a person if you don't know which pronoun do you to use or if they have a gender neutral name? I usually write around the need to use a pronoun. So that's an editing thing. Do we say dear if we don't know them? I do. It's considered formal writing. How do you recover when you send an email to the wrong person or you CC the wrong person with the same name? Right. So I use that as a as an ex, as a opportunity to say hello and catch up with somebody that I haven't talked to in a while, probably. So just first, Dale Carnegie, admit it quickly and emphatically when you make a mistake. And then second, um, just be cheerful and friendly. Oh, thank you for the praise sandwich, Davey. I appreciate that. I appreciate that a lot. Um, and how to reply to email with template. Um, so save the template in your um, drafts box. And then you just copy and paste the template into the fresh email. And then you make it specific. So you're hopefully not using a, well, the one that Dr. Berdahl had, you would just completely copy that over. And other ones you might, you know, put the person's name spelled correctly at the beginning and, you know, change any other details that you need to change. But, um, yeah, re somebody suggesting read out loud when you're not sure about the tone of voice. And how do you minimize long, long threads? Call a Zoom meeting? Yeah, absolutely. Calling a meeting can sometimes be the right answer. Um, and, you know, formatting it rather than making it brief. So using numbered lists, using headers. So if you use a head, so you're almost getting into technical memo territory rather than an email. So it might make sense to pull that out into a Word document, put some headers, put a table of contents, you know, maybe. Like every situation is different. Any thoughts on the use of Grammarly or Ginger? Well, use them if you have nothing else, but it's better to use a real editor. Of course, I'm going to say that. Um, it's always good if you're checking yourself. The more the more checking you can do. I know. So when I write emails in French, I I always check myself on Google Translate, which probably isn't the best option, but I at least make sure that I'm saying mostly what I mean to say. Um, so if English is your second language, that would always be good to double check. 
how do you recover when you're the person who misspells someone's name? I apologize quickly and emphatically. And then I say, I owe you a beer or something, even though, you know, they might be at the other side of the world. Just apologize and then say, uh, however, then you could think of a praise. I really liked what you said on the email list about X, Y, Z. You were asking about thank you for your time and thank you for your consideration. I think that it's always excellent to include those really. I mean, who cares if someone thinks you're cliche, other people are just gonna get a good vibe off you. So think there's certain words that, um, there's certain words that just make people feel happier. 